Hello, dear Prospect Walker. Welcome to RTV 2021 for November the 8th, 2021. Hope you're doing well on this Monday, this beginning of the week. And I hope you have a great week this week. So our text for today, as we begin the week, we have 2 Kings 21, uh, pivotal text in the book of 2 Kings. We have uh, Hosea 14, so we're finishing up the book of Hosea today. Uh, Hebrews 3, and then finally Psalm 139, uh, text I preached on actually a few weeks ago. So uh, we'll start with Hebrews 3. That's where I have my Bible open right now. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, Hebrews, this, episto uh, this epistolary sermon, uh, sermon in, in the form of an epistle or a letter, uh, is a book in the New, New Testament famous for a couple of things, uh, but it really probably most famous for focusing on two specific things. Number one, a high Christology, a high view of Jesus, of, what he, of who he is as uh, as the Son of God and as divine, uh, as the Creator, as the Redeemer, uh, the roles that God Himself plays in the Old Testament, and uh, the second thing it's known for is, of course, uh, several warning texts that we find throughout the uh, the book. We've already encountered one of these in chapter two. Uh, then we have this one in chapter three, going really into chapter four, and then probably the most famous one is in chapter six. Uh, verses th four through eight, and then you have another one in chapter 10, verses 26 through 31. So a uh, number of these warning passages, and I thought I'd go ahead and, and talk about how to handle these before, um, handle these, and I think I've talked about this before, probably earlier in the year, but let's hit it on, hit on it again. Uh, but before we do that, let me just point out that uh, this is a text, that, at least in the first part of it, that we once again have a, a high Christology, a, a very high view of who Jesus is. He is um, he even encourages us to consider Jesus this, this high priest of our, conf our confession. He is the great high priest. Um, he, is, uh, he is appointed, uh, even as Moses was uh, in all his house, he was appointed uh, by God, and he, and he is faithful to the charge that God has given him. He is the builder of, of, uh, of, of his people, and Christ was faithful as a son over his whole house, and so on and so forth. Speaking of Moses, then uh, he immediately, this author of, of Hebrews, goes into a warning passage, and the, uh, the object lesson for the warning is, of course, the people of Israel in the wilderness wanderings uh, in the story of the Exodus, where they are grumbling and complaining on their way to the promised land, which leads to them ultimately uh, being excluded from going into the promised land. Um, that grumbling and complaining and ultimately their lack of faith uh, and uh, not believing that God would actually allow them to conquer that land after the spies came back with their report, if you remember that story. And so the, the author here, after he uh, quotes from the Old Testament in verses 7 through 11, he then goes to, um, by the way, they're quoting from Psalm 95, uh, then he goes into, moves into, uh, in verse 12, an exhortation. Take care that you there not be any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Um, and then how do you, how do you uh, respond to that exhortation? Well, we need to encourage one another day after day, as long as it's still called today, that none of us be hardened by the deceitful, deceitfulness of sin. Um we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast to uh, the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. Perseverance of the saints is what he's talking about here, right? Uh, so uh, these have always created controversy because at, a, at a kind of a first reading of this, it appears that what this author is talking about is that uh, you could, in fact, uh, if you're a brother, as he states in verse 12, um, you could, in fact, start to possess this evil, unbelieving heart and fall away from the living God. In other words, you're, you're there with the living God, and then you can fall away. In other words, uh, some have argued that this is a text showing that you could lose your salvation. Well, of course, we're a good Baptist, and we don't believe that. Uh, and there's, there's reasons to see that in other texts of Scripture that are very clear. So if Scripture interprets Scripture, how can we reconcile those other texts that are very clear that show that uh, that we cannot lose our salvation. A good example would be, for instance, John 6, where it talks about how Jesus is, um, where Jesus himself says that all that the Father gives to me uh, will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. 
so how do we reconcile this? Well, traditionally, there have been several interpretations. Uh, one is that these are just, um, uh, it's just a, a, a hypothetical, that there's a warning there, but, um, but we really don't need it. Uh, number two is that it's related to losing rewards. A, a great theologian named Charles Hodge once held to that. You go to heaven, but you don't get your rewards. Well, I don't think that's what's being talked about here. Um, some say it's it's uh, that teaching, again, that you can apostatize, that you can uh, be a, uh, a, a believer in Christ, and then you can lose that salvation. And then probably the most common view among Baptist is a kind of a more typical reform view, is, and that is that it's speaking of almost Christians, those people who are in the body of Christ and almost believing in Jesus, but then fall away. Um, I think there's a better way of looking at this, and that is as a what I would call pastoral warning. This is a view held by one of my uh, professors, Tom Schreiner. He has a great book on this uh, called The Race Set Before Us. Uh, where he kind of talks about the book of Hebrews as a whole and the idea of perseverance and assurance that, that is at the, the heart of, of uh, the big book of Hebrews. And he argues that uh, this is, these are actually real warnings. Uh, they're not just hypotheticals. Uh, but what it's talking about ultimately is that, uh, that uh, it, it's talking to true Christians. And if a true Christian uh, is in fact a true Christian, he will or she will, in fact, heed that warning. The, the truly saved will always heed the warning and be saved. It, and what it functions as then is a means of perseverance. It's a means uh, of the perseverance of the saints. Uh, the promise then entail, en, entails responsibility, right? That we need to be heeding warnings, that we need to be uh, persing, persevering in our faith. We need to be, as Paul will tell us in Philippians 2, working out our salvation with fear and trembling. So, we can talk more about this when we get to chapter six, because that's an even more controversial text, but that's kind of an initial view of this, that this is a means of God. These warnings are the means of by which he persevere, helps us to persevere uh, in our journey of faith. All right, moving on over to, let's see, we got uh, Second Kings. We'll go over there. So Second Kings 21, is, as I mentioned, pivotal text in the, in the book of Second Kings, because what we find here. Uh, is the kind of the last straw. Uh, that's a, a, an expression we often use, right? The, uh, the, referring to uh, that, that last opportunity that somebody might have before uh, the, the dam breaks. And the dam breaks here in uh, 2 Kings 21. And that person to break the, uh, the dam is a king named Manasseh. Manasseh, son of Hezekiah, he was 12 years old when he became king, as we read in this text. That means that if Hezekiah had 15 years left, that he was born sometime in those 15 years that God had granted Hezekiah after his severe illness. Uh, this gets back to what we were talking about yesterday. But then notice what Manasseh does. I mean, you can read his resume here. Um, he is one who, for instance, built altars uh, to the host of heaven within the temple. So he's participating in pagan worship within the temple. He is, uh, verse 6, passing his son through fire. Uh, he is filling Jerusalem from one end to the other uh, with innocent blood, uh, verse 16. Uh, he has done more wickedly than even the Canaanites, uh, verse 11. Uh, and because of this, notice what it says, uh, verse 11, because Manasseh did these things, did these abominations, therefore, uh, God is bringing calamity on Jerusalem. In other words, this is the event. This is the reason why the exile came. Now, obviously, it, it was a long time coming with uh, all these other kings who had led Israel astray, who had led the, the Jewish people astray, but this is that final event. Uh, so it'll still be uh, several decades before the exile actually happens, uh, but Manasseh seems to be kind of exhibit A of why the exile happened. And of course, remember the purpose of the author of Kings is to show why are we here? So if you read through his resume, it's not a very good one. It's like he did a whole bunch of evil things, and then he died. Now, what will be really interesting is when we get to the book of First, uh, Second Chronicles, because in Second Chronicles, we get a, a slightly different picture of Manasseh. We actually learned there that he actually repented. But the author here is not concerned to show Manasseh's repentance. Uh, and the reason is, is because he's trying to demonstrate to the Israelites, this is the reason why we ended up here in 
in Babylon in exile. And it's because of evil kings like Manasseh who reigned for that long with that much evil. All right. Uh, Manasseh has a son you can see here uh, who um, uh, Amnon or Ammon uh, who um, does the same kind of thing. And, and he is killed. And this sets the stage for uh, as dark and as evil as Manasseh was, uh, we have another king who is perhaps just as bright, and that is Josiah, and we'll talk about him in 2 Kings 22. Uh, that'll be tomorrow. So let's move over to, we've done uh, Hebrews 3, um, and we did, uh, let's see, what else? We did uh, 2 Kings 21. Let's go over to Hosea. Uh, so we're finishing up the book of Hosea, and he finishes up with some final uh, warnings, but also a final blessing of sort, a uh, promise of future restoration. So when you read through this chapter, you'll see that uh, that God has promised here that he will heal their apostasy. apostasy. He will love them freely, kind of getting back to the original metaphor. So this kind of fix, uh, forms a kind of bookend for a, or a resolution to that original mess metaphor where uh, Hosea, of course, uh, was one who had been instructed to marry Gomer as an illustration of Israel's relationship with God and God's relationship with Israel. And so loving them freely, uh, this is in response to their apostasy, right? It's in the response to their spiritual adultery. God says, I will do this. And, and of course, we know ultimately the way in which he does this, right? He, he loves them freely. He brings them back. He restores Israel. And the only way he does this is through the new covenant and it's through the work of Jesus Christ. Um, so there's a, a good picture of, of uh, a good way to end this book. There's some warnings here still as well, but it's a good way of ending this, this text with on, on some, something of a high note. And then finally, we have Psalm 139. Psalm 139 is a uh, text, as I mentioned at the beginning, that I preached on a few weeks ago in our Summer of Psalms sermon series. And I mentioned this was my, my favorite psalm. Uh, love Psalm 139. You'll notice that it's divided into um, four sets of, of uh, six verses. So one through six, uh, seven through 12, then you have 13 through uh, 18, and then finally 19 through 24. And each of these verses, sets of verses, deals with a different characteristic of God. So uh, you'll notice that it presents a very big picture of God, as I mentioned in my sermon. Uh, and you could go check that out from a few weeks ago. Um, but uh, he and, and he's in, he's infinitely powerful uh, as you read through this. He is omniscient. First six verses speak of this. That it means that he knows knows all things. Uh, he is uh, omnipresent. Where can I flee from your spirit? Verses seven through twelve. Uh, this is mean. He is. He is all places. Uh, he is, of course, um, omnipotent. Uh, that we That's something we see in verses uh, 13 uh, through 18, talk about his creation. And then finally, uh, omnipotent, referring to all being all powerful. And then finally, he is uh, what I called in my sermon, omnijust. Uh, and this is found in verses 19 through 24. So uh, what are we to say uh, about these? Well, as I mentioned in my sermon, he's not just these omnis, right? Omnipresent, omnipowerful, omniscient, uh, omnipotent, uh, but he's also a God who is not just infinitely powerful, but he's intensely personal. So if you remember my, my points of, in my sermon was that, I'm looking him up right now, uh, he is uh, on infinitely uh, knowing, he's om omniscient, but he knows you. He is um, omnipresent, but he's always with you. He is uh, omnipotent, but he created you. And he is omniscient, or he's omnijust, and he will judge you. So he is not just big beyond imagination, but he's also, uh, he is also infinitely uh, and intimately involved in our lives. That's the God that we worship and serve. So I love Psalm 139. It's a great psalm just to kind of meditate on uh, as you uh, go throughout the day and chew on as you go throughout the day today. Uh, by the way, this was the, the, I don't know if you remember 
the sermon, I, I used the poem uh, from, um, from Thompson um, entitled, I'm, tr I'm trying to think, where was that title? Uh, entitled The Hound of Heaven. I don't know if you remember that. So that's, um, you might want to look that one up. That's a wonderful poem uh, to check out. So I hope you have a great rest of the day on this day, November 8th, 2021.